Welcome to video number seven in this series of rebuttals to Hank Hanegraaff's book, Christianity in Crisis. I'm Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek. In this video, I'm going to talk about the section entitled Sickness and Suffering. In this section, Hanegraaff says, we all get sick and eventually we all die, including every single person committed to the faith movement. As much as the faith teachers would have you believe otherwise, there are no exceptions to the rule. Well, sure, we all encounter sickness from time to time. Word of Faith teachers don't deny that. But the Word of Faith teaches that physical healing has been provided for us in the atonement, and that through faith, believers can appropriate what Jesus' stripes purchased at Calvary. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. Kenneth Hagin himself admitted to being attacked with various physical ailments, but he stood his ground with the Word of God and would eventually receive his healing. I saw him live it out, too. He was 65 years old when I began attending Ramah, and in the two years I was there, he never missed a meeting due to illness. And the worst symptom I ever saw was a couple of morning teaching sessions where he sounded a bit stopped up. He continued working right up until the day he died 20 years later. Hanegraaff also raises the issue of Fred Price's wife, Betty, being stricken with cancer, and adds that she profusely thanked her doctors for the painful radiation and chemotherapy she has received from them. Now, I guess the implication here is that Word of Faith people don't believe in doctors and medicine, which isn't true at all. Ideally, they won't be necessary, but if they are, why not take advantage of them? Betty Price did, and over 25 years later, she's still with us. Hannah Graff then goes on to say that Kenneth Hagin might say that he hasn't had a sick day in nearly 60 years, but the truth is he has had several heart attacks and a complete heart stoppage. I think the implication here is that Kenneth Hagin lied about not having any sick days. And what is his source for this claim about Kenneth Hagin's heart attacks? Why, it's Kenneth Hagin himself. Now that's strange. How can he be both dishonest and a reliable source at the same time? You see, what Hank Hanegraaff doesn't bother to tell you is that Kenneth Hagin defined sick days for his readers. In his book, The Name of Jesus, published in 1979, he said, I have not had one sick day in 45 years. I didn't say that the devil hasn't attacked me, but before the day is out, I am healed. So as you can see, Kenneth Hagin wasn't saying that he had never had any physical ailments. He defined a sick day as a day where he doesn't receive his healing by the end of the day. His definition of sick days should have been included in Hannah Graff's comments for clarity. As for avoiding death, neither Hank Hanegraaff nor any other Word of Faith opponent will be able to provide any evidence that any mainstream Word of Faith teacher denies the eventuality of death, and it's completely dishonest to suggest that they do. Kenneth Hagin said numerous times that if Jesus delays his return, we'll all die because the law of sin and death is still at work on the earth. His only stipulation is that you don't have to die from sickness. You can just live out your days free from sickness and disease and then fall asleep in Jesus when you're old. As I showed on my blog, that's exactly how he went back in 2003. He was sitting at the table at his home and suddenly he was gone. Hannah Graff goes on to recount the story of a Rhema student whose wife contracted ovarian cancer. Then she refused medical attention and died. What he failed to mention is that they were never taught that at Rhema. They were never told to refuse medical attention. To the contrary, while I was a student at Rhema, Pastor Ken told us emphatically not to deny our families, doctors, and medical attention if they were necessary. He threatened to expel any student that he heard about who did so. Hannah Graff continues his story by saying that this woman's family tried to raise her from the dead, and when that didn't work, they started confessing that she would come back in another body. Well, there you go, Hank. That right there shows you that these people weren't playing with a full deck, assuming that this story is even true. 
As I stated earlier, the word of faith doesn't teach reincarnation. Next, Hanegraaff uses the guilt by association tactic of taking similar statements from the father of New Thought metaphysics, Phineas Quimby, and Kenneth Hagin to suggest that they're teaching the same thing, which is not true. Quimby said that all disease is in the mind. Kenneth Hagin said that God is a spirit and that disease is spiritual in origin. Quimby believed that you're healed through the mind. Kenneth Hagin believed that God heals in response to faith, which is of the spirit or the heart, and that you can have faith in your heart even with doubt in your mind. Quimby used mesmerism or hypnosis. Kenneth Hagin used faith in the Word of God. Hanegraaff then proceeds to give us a lesson on Isaiah 53, 5, which says, By his stripes we are healed, which is often quoted in the word of faith to receive healing. Hanegraaff says that the Hebrew word rapha often refers to spiritual rather than physical healing, which is true. He then says that Isaiah was very clearly referring to spiritual healing, but surprisingly, he admits that the verse preceding it, Isaiah 53, 4, does refer to physical healing. This is what I refer to as the magic context theory. It's like the magic bullet theory in the JFK assassination that says that the bullet stopped in midair, changed directions, and then struck Governor Connolly. Hanegraaff apparently believes that the concept magically changes from physical healing to spiritual healing, healing between the two verses. This is especially fascinating when you consider the fact that the book wasn't divided into chapter and verse for another 2,000 years. He goes on to say that Isaiah 53, 4 was fulfilled in Matthew 8, 16 and 17, where it says, They brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Hanegraaff says that the fact that it was fulfilled then means that it doesn't apply to us today. Well, maybe he should have read the rest of the book of Matthew. Because in Matthew 12, verses 17 through 21, he also said, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name... Gentiles will trust. Now, if I'm not mistaken, Hank Hanegraaff is a Gentile. I know I'm a Gentile, and as a Gentile believer, I assure you, I trust that this passage still applies today. Any Bible student ought to know that Matthew was writing to the Jews of the first century. When he stated that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, he was referring to evidence from the scriptures that Jesus fulfilled the prophecies concerning Messiah. He wasn't writing to 21st century apologists and heresy hunters to prove that these things aren't available to us today. If Matthew 8.17 doesn't apply to us today, then Matthew 12.21 doesn't either. You can't have it both ways, Hank. The belief that physical healing is provided for believers in the atonement was around long before the Word of Faith movement. In fact, the Assemblies of God denomination includes it in their statement of fundamental truths, stating, Divine healing of the sick is provided for us in the atonement. Hanegraaff goes on to the subject of Satan and sickness. He says that in the Word of Faith, demons are behind every sickness. Wrong again, Hank. While I was at Ramah, Kenneth Hagin clearly stated that sometimes there are demonic forces, but not always. You can see that through Jesus' ministry. Sometimes he just healed people, but there were times when he healed by casting out demons, 
as in the case with the boy with seizures in Luke 9, verses 40 through 44. While Satan is behind all sickness in a general sense because sickness entered the world through sin, only a minority of sicknesses seem to be demonic in nature. And in those cases, the gift of discerning of spirits might be required in order to bring healing. Hanegraaff then tries to make the case that sometimes God makes people sick or handicapped for his sovereign purposes, which is supposed to prove that not all sickness comes from Satan. To prove that, he cites Exodus 4.11 that says that God made the mute, the deaf, and the blind. That's supposed to mean that God chooses for some people to be impaired. Talk about taking a verse out of context. This one takes the cake. God is responding to Moses' fear about speaking to Pharaoh because he's slow of speech. God tells him that there's nothing to fear, that he created all people, including the deaf, the dumb, the seeing, and the blind. Because of that, he knows how their physical bodies work, and he says that he will speak through Moses when he goes before Pharaoh. Nothing is said here about it being God's sovereign will for some to be blind, deaf, or dumb. The translation that Hanegraaff uses reads the way he wants it to read. In the NIV, God asked Moses, Who makes him deaf or dumb? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? However, the New King James Version reads, who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? There's a totally different meaning that Hanegraaff would like to read into it. While one version says that God made the blind man, the other, the other version says that God made the man blind. In a previous video, I discussed Mark 11:22, and how the Greek literally reads, have the faith of God. And you have to determine from the context and your own theological viewpoint how to translate it. <clears throat> well, the same thing is true of Hebrew. The literal Hebrew has no word in this passage for him. It reads more like who makes blind. You have to determine from the context how to translate it. Most translations are similar to the NIV that Hank Canagraph quotes, but some translations do offer a different interpretation. Let's look at a few. The Jubilee Bible 2000 says, And the Lord said unto him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the dumb, or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Am not I the Lord? The Dewey Rames Bible says, The Lord said to him, Who made man's mouth? Or who made the dumb and the deaf, the seeing and the blind? Did not I? Webster's Bible translation says, And the Lord said to him, who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? When I was young, I installed carpet for a living, and one day I arrived in an apartment complex office and requested the keys for the unit that I was going to work in. The lady at the desk asked me, Are you the blind man? She thought I was there to install blinds, but the way she asked the question, it sounded like she was asking me if I was blind. I told her that I can see just fine, and we both had a good laugh. You see, context is everything. And the context in Exodus 4.11 isn't that God in his sovereignty chooses to make some people deaf, mute, or blind. The context, who made man's mouth, is that God made all of us. And if he's able to do that, he's able to give Moses the words to speak. In the chapter called Sovereignty and Sickness, Hanegraaff says that the word of faith teaching that you shouldn't pray if it be thy will when praying for healing isn't biblical. Because in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told us to pray, Thy will be done. And in Gethsemane, he prayed, If it be thy will. Well, this just shows you how little Hank Hanegraaff knows about his subject matter. Kenneth Hagin taught that there are different rules for different kinds of prayer. For the prayer of consecration, like Jesus prayed in Gethsemane, you should pray, if it be thy will, because you don't know God's will in the matter. But, if you're praying the prayer of petition, as in the case of healing, you know God's will, 
because it's already been clearly expressed in his word. So you just ask in faith and give him thanks because you know that he heard and answered. You can see this demonstrated by the apostles in the book of Acts, who never prayed, if it be thy will, when healing the sick. Think about it for a minute. Do we tell people to pray, if it be thy will, when inviting them to receive Jesus? No, because we know that God wants everybody to repent and receive eternal life. Well, if we don't teach, if it be thy will, for salvation, why do we feel obligated to teach it regarding healing? Hanegraaff then says that word of faith people don't believe in the sovereignty of God. Now, that, of course, is not true. But they may not view God's sovereignty in quite the same way as others do. First of all, let's define sovereignty. The dictionary defines it as the ultimate authority. In many nations of the world today, there's a sovereign ruler. There's no authority beyond his. Of course, this isn't true in the United States and other democratic countries. We have a president who presides over the people, but at the same time is accountable to the people. If you don't believe that, consider Richard Nixon. If by sovereign you mean that God is God and he can do anything, then I would disagree because God cannot lie. Hebrews 6.18 He is bound by his word. 2 Timothy 2.13 says that he remains faithful and he cannot deny himself. John 1.1 1, 1 tells us that God and his word are one. Therefore, if God is sovereign, then his word is sovereign. There's no authority beyond the authority of God's word. What some people apparently mean by the sovereignty of God is that he can lie if he wants to or change his mind whenever he jolly well pleases. I disagree. Hanegraaff states that it is impossible to frustrate the sovereign will of God. According to that quasi-Calvinist line of thinking, God must want a lot of people in hell because Jesus said that the road to destruction is broad and many go in by it. Matthew 7:13. Either it's God's sovereign will that they go there or Hank is wrong again. This view also encounters some difficulty in explaining why God regretted that he made man, Genesis 6-7. It's obviously quite possible to frustrate God's will because of the fact that God gave us a free will. This view of sovereignty leads to either of two extremes. Predestination teaches that the sovereign God alone determines who will be saved and who will be lost, and is considered by most Christians to be false doctrine. And then there's ultimate restoration. That's the other extreme that teaches that since God is sovereign and since he doesn't want anyone to go to hell, everybody will eventually be saved, including the devil. This is what Carlton Pearson has been teaching in recent years. It's also referred to as universalism. And it's rejected by most Christians as false doctrine. The extremes of both of these views relieve man of any responsibility. But the truth is, God doesn't want anyone to go to hell, but He has given everyone a choice in the matter and won't violate the law of free will that He Himself has decreed. The reason we can come to Jesus in faith for salvation is that we heard the word preached and believe that it's God's will that we be saved and that Jesus paid the price for our sins. That same free will is a factor in receiving physical healing. We hear that God forgives all of our iniquities and heals all our diseases, that Jesus came to show us the Father, and Jesus never refused to heal anybody, that the elders of the church can anoint us with oil and pray the prayer of faith, and the Lord will raise us up, that Jesus bore our diseases, the healing, that healing is the children's bread, that believers will lay hands on the sick and that they'll recover, and on and on. When we hear the word preached concerning healing, it brings faith, just like hearing the gospel of salvation brings faith. But the final results are still determined by the faith and free will of the individual. Finally, Hank Hanegraaff makes the claim that the sovereignty of God is the overarching principle of the Bible. Well, search through the Bible and see how many times the word sovereign is in there. 
You won't find it at all in the King James Version, and it's used sparingly in other translations. Now, the NIV does translate Jehovah as sovereign instead of Lord, but it's inconsistent with most other translations. I don't mean to infer that because the word isn't in there that God isn't sovereign. But if the sovereignty of God was the overarching principle, it seems to me that it would be mentioned a few times. The sovereignty of God is a given, but it isn't the main theme of the Bible. Now, let me tell you what the overarching principle of the Bible is. I mean, if he can give you his opinion, I can give you mine, right? It's faith. It's believing and acting on God's word to bring about his provision and redemption for all of mankind. That brings us to the end of this series on Christianity in Crisis. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again in future videos.